Well, last week, the divine words of Hosea 8, verse 12, ignited a talk on the irreplaceable value of the law of Moses for Israel and for Judeo-Christianity, as well as its impact on the entire human population of the earth. And also, why it is logical that such a moral law code could only have been given to us from outside the bounds of the finite. And that for humanity to ignore or even attempt to abrogate it is the most fatal of follies. We need no further evidence of what occurs when that attempted abrogation happens than a horizon to horizon chaos and confusion that has engulfed our planet, including the modern church. It brings on a confusion of right and wrong, good and evil, that has even filtered down to the most basic of all human attributes, gender. But more to the matter at hand, and as it states in verse 12 of Hosea 8, I write him so many things from my Torah, yet he considers them foreign. Here's what we learn. We learn it here that Ephraim Israel is, in God's eyes, without excuse. Hosea knew, as all Israel knew, of a written form of all that God gave to his mediator Moses on Mount Sinai. So while it's true that so much of what the Torah teaches was handed down mouth to ear over the centuries, it wasn't because there was no written document to refer to, but rather because since copying that enormous document was painstaking, and it, so it took a long time to even make a single copy, and as a natural consequence there were only a few in existence. Of course it would have been the monarchy and the priesthood that would have possessed them. And yet, because of intentional disregard and giving in to the inherent evil inclination of the fallen human mind, the many things that God commanded Israel from the Torah had come to be considered as not for them. Imagine that. These many things had in but a few generations become foreign to the very people to whom it was given, either obsolete or countermanded or sloughed off and seen as for another people. Now, does that sound familiar? It is a bedrock principle. It is shouted from the pulpits worldwide that the Torah that contains the Law of Moses is obsolete, or it was countermanded by the advent of Yeshua, or it is for another people, the Jews. As recorded in Matthew chapter 5, Christ emphasized to the thousands who heard His Sermon on the Mount that He didn't change even the tiniest of the commandments and that until heaven and earth pass away, Nothing about the Torah or the prophets would change, yet the church to this very day vehemently denies it. And as a result, the institutional church has found itself in an untenable place that all but the fewest have yet to recognize. It no longer has a written and an objective moral law code. I mean, the church took a path to make God's moral law code subjective, individually tailored. Ephraim Israel paid a terrible price for such a mindset. Now, what may be in store for those of us, our brothers and sisters in the Lord, who insist on following that same illogical, non-biblical, 
disobedient path? Well, I think the Bible's clear on it. God does not accept their or our worship. So, open your Bibles as we read the final two verses of Hosea chapter 8. Hosea chapter 8. Hosea chapter 8. I'm going to read verses 13 through 15. They offer me sacrifices of flesh and eat them, but Adonai doesn't accept them. Now he will recall their crimes and punish their sins. They will return to Egypt. For Israel forgot his maker and built palaces. Judah made more fortified cities, but I'll send fire on his cities and it will consume their strongholds. There have been numerous attempts to translate this verse, and we've read the complete Jewish Bible attempt. Here's a couple of others for verse 13. In the King James Version, they sacrifice flesh for the sacrifices of mine offerings and eat it, but the Lord accepteth them not. But now he will remember their iniquity and visit their sins, and they shall return to Egypt. The RSV, they love sacrifice, they sacrifice flesh and eat it, but the Lord has no delight in them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins, and they shall return to Egypt. Now really, most Bible versions interpret those words within a pretty similar thought pattern. Frankly, the first half of the verse makes little sense when it's translated that way. They are all made all these translations are made to smack of the Lord, simply not liking the concept of a sacrificial system, which of course has been the rather standard Christian philosophy since the late third century. But if we remove that erroneous assumption, then an altogether meaning surfaces, a meaning that ties together with the Torah commandments that God has just upbraided Israel for not obeying. A better meaning is cited by Gruber is this, when they present to me generous sacrifices, which they burn before for me, let them eat meat, Jehovah does not want them. Okay. In the Torah, eating meat was tied to the act of sacrificing. And whereas according to the law of Moses, sacrifices for sin, and there were five categories of sacrifices, only two of them directly dealt with sin, it usually did not allow the lay person presenting them to eat any portion of the sacrificed meat animal, and instead it required that all of it was either burned up on the altar, this was the means of giving it to God, or some was burned up and the rest of it was eaten by the priests. Now Jehovah is saying that Israel's attempted sacrifices to him are so perverted, so wrong-minded, that he doesn't want them at all. For all the good it does, the person may just as well go ahead and eat all the meat himself. Now allow me to use a more modern application that while it's not a precise equivalent, it is closely associated and it has the same effect. It is this. Don't bother to tithe your money to your synagogue or your church if you don't do it with the right mindset or the understanding of what it is you're doing. Don't do it. Or if you're not quite sure who or what you believe in. Or if the institution you are thinking of tithing to is unworthy of it from God's moral law code perspective, because perhaps they don't teach or practice biblical truth. And you know, it's rare that I teach on tithing because it so greatly bothers me 
that our Judeo-Christian religious institutions tend to hold their hands out at every opportunity and have, to my thinking, regularly perverted the intent and practice of tithing. So I'm just going to briefly comment on it. First, do not give if you don't want to give with a generous heart and an open hand. If it feels like it's something you are coerced to do, however unwillingly, don't. Second, are you a believer? Well, yes, then tithing is your God-commanded obligation to Him. If no, then it's not. Yet, if the idea of love shown to God as obedience is not your motive for giving, then you may as well keep your money and just use it for yourself. Third, blindly giving without knowing to who and to what you are giving is not a good idea. The number of Christians who have no idea where their money is actually going is enormous. For instance, I personally know of financially thriving Christian organizations that speak of supporting Christianity in Israel in hopes of getting funds, and they're quite successful at it, but in fact, they're just fronts for anti-Jewish, anti-Israel, anti-Zionist activities. Then there are the emotional and never-ending pleas from TV evangelists, sometimes local pastors, for more money that are often followed by promises of riches and God's blessings if you will sufficiently respond. In other words, the attempt is to purchase God's favor. This is not what sacrifices were for, even though that is exactly what pagans used them for and what Israel had devel devolved into believing. Nor is this what tithing is about. Finally, how much should you give? Well, the meaning of tithe is one-tenth. So the rather standard Christian model of asking for 10% of your income is biblical. Yet, even that's only partly so. In the moral law code God gave to Israel, 10% was the minimum. There were a number of types of sacrifices, with many of them, such as a first fruits offering, demanding a much higher portion to be set apart for God and for support of His earthly institutions. So, there you have it. It is not complicated, but it is serious. Tithing willfully, joyfully, this is part of our faith and it is expected by God. It's not a tradition. It's not a doctrine. It's His divine ordinance. I can't promise you material rewards even if you do it in the proper manner and mindset that I've just told you. But I can promise you a closer, more intimate relationship with the Father, and you can have an expectation of God's shalom, His well-being, falling upon you regardless of your personal circumstances, if you obey and do it. Okay, let's move on. It's interesting that when interpreted properly, we see that God is attacking Ephraim Israel's system of sacrificing. That is, Israel had resorted to creating a systemized, mechanical approach to sacrificing with a quid pro quo expectation. For many years prior to around 745 BC, it had seemed to work quite well for them. They were a prosperous nation. They were generally at peace with their neighbors, and yet, because the giving and the sacrificing was by an unrepentant people, Jehovah did not accept those gifts and sacrifices, so it would have been better for them to have not sacrificed at all. 
Israel had come to mentally sort of tie together their religious system with their prosperity, so they had badly miscalculated. Very suddenly, their system quit producing the same results. So what was their response? Rather than revert to their God-given faith or question why circumstances were changing for the worse, they doubled down on that same system. A modern-day proverb is that the definition of insanity is to keep doing the same things but expecting different results. And by the way, in the complete Jewish Bible, when we see the word Adonai as not accepting those sacrifices, and in other versions, more typically, it is the Lord, in fact, that is not what it says. It says Yehovah, God's formal name. This is just one of six thousand times in the Old Testament that this name exchange occurs in our English Bibles. It's important that we know God's name. It's important that we use God's name when identifying Him. It is who He is. If He did not want us to know His name, He wouldn't have given it. And His inspired writers would not have used it six thousand times. What's in a name? In Yehovah's case, everything. Well, the last half of verse 13 is, Now He will recall their crimes and punish their sins. They will return to Egypt. What we have here is God following through with the threat of a curse upon Israel issued long ago should they sufficiently violate His covenant with them. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 64 through 69 says this, Adonai the Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other, and there you will serve other gods made of wood and stone, which neither you nor your ancestors have known. Among these nations you will not find repose. There will be no rest for the sole of your foot. Rather, Adonai will give you there anguish of heart, dimness of eyes, apathy of spirit. Your life will hang in doubt before you. You will be afraid night and day. Have no assurance that you will stay alive. In the morning you'll say, oh, how I wish it were evening. In the evening you'll say, oh, how I wish it were morning. Because of the fear overwhelming your heart, the sights your eyes will see. Finally, Adam and I will bring you back in ships to Egypt, the place of which I said to you, you'll never see it again. And there you will try to sell yourselves as slaves to your enemies, but no one will buy you. These are the words of the covenant which Adonai ordered Moses to make with the people of Israel in the land of Moab, in addition to the covenant which he made with them in Horeb, Mount Sinai. Okay, here we have an occasion of a double meaning of what it means to go back to Egypt. Israel literally did try at first to run to Egypt for help before turning to Assyria. But later, even though Assyria didn't scatter them to Egypt, the term Egypt also has the meaning of going back into a condition of misery and captivity and oppression at the hands of Gentiles, just as they once suffered in the land of Egypt before God through Moses rescued them. Now the final verse of chapter 8 explains the why of the previous verse. The Lord is going to punish Israel in these ways. Why? Because they forgot their Maker. Clearly, context demands that any mention of Judah here can only be an insertion 
at the hand of a future editor, probably sometime after the fall of Judah to Babylon. Hosea is entirely a message to Ephraim Israel, not to Judah. Further, what Israel built was not palaces, but rather what they built was temples. This message is about religious matters. It's not about housing. The Hebrew word is hechal, hechal. And while there are instances that it can legitimately be used to speak of a king's palace, the context here is of temples. Now, who did Israel build temples to? Now, I'm sure if you asked any Israelite, he would have said, well, to God. And I'm equally sure he would have been very sincere about it. But the mere fact that any Israelite would have built a temple, that was automatically a violation of the Torah. There was to be one temple only. It was already in existence in Jerusalem. But even more, the God they envisioned was one of their own image. Not the one of the Bible, despite what they may have decided to call him. And when this verse speaks of Israel having forgotten their maker, it doesn't mean to forget in the sense of where did I put my car keys. The word is shakach, shakach. And it more means to set something aside or to ignore something out of neglect. It also carries with it the notion of something, in this case a relationship, that's just slowly withering away. So over time, Israel's relationship with God withered away as they progressively ignored God's Torah and neglected to obey His commandments. Now, believers, <laughs> you may have convinced yourself that you have a relationship with God, but if you are not in His Word and praying, and being obedient to His commandments, your relationship with God is pure fantasy. And I can speak from an experience. As a younger man who knew Jesus was my, was my Savior, I knew Him my entire life, who was raised in a solid Christian home, I had somehow rationalized that my wrong beliefs, that my bad choices, how I live my life as an adult, didn't have to reflect my knowledge that Jesus existed and that He was the Son of God. All those rules in the Bible were, to me, not applicable, because they're for, they're for an ancient people. Instead, Christ had given me liberty. Liberty for what? To me, anything I wanted to do. Looking back, it was because I wanted to live my life in a certain way without any fetters. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. To have spent the time with the Father, to have obeyed Him, most definitely would have cramped my style. But denying all this was a pretty easy thing to do. Because as I looked around at others who called themselves Christians, only some were much better. It took a tragedy in my life before the Lord finally got my attention enough that I was willing to face what I had become and to change. And even then it was a process, a painful but worthwhile process. And we see this same God pattern described here in Hosea as concerns the people of Israel. They aren't ready to change. And so tragedy is about to strike. And then after the tra tragedy and then the recognition of their culpability, there's going to be a long journey back, painful journey that's going to be needed before God accepts them back into the fold. Well, in the last few words of chapter 8, God makes the most explicit threat yet. He is going to destroy their strongholds, that is, their walled cities, with fire. 
And this is going to be accomplished on his behalf by Assyria. That which Israel believes is going to save them, their fortresses and their alliances, won't. In the Bible, fire is always used for one of two things, purification or destruction. When God is said to be sending fire, it is meant as sending His destructive wrath. Well, as we conclude this chapter and move on into chapter 9, it's important that we notice that all of these woes that God is pronouncing upon Israel represent covenant curses. Pursuit by enemies, destruction, judgment by fire, crop failures, losing the results of one's efforts and labors to an enemy, the end of nationhood, and then returning to Egypt, returning to captivity, all reflect specific punishments for specific violations precisely as written down in the Torah. Okay, let's move on to Hosea chapter 9. Open your Bibles to Hosea chapter 9, please. Hosea chapter 9, starting at verse 1. Don't rejoice, Israel. (laughs) Don't enjoy yourselves as other peoples do. For you have gone whoring away from your God. You love being hired as a whore on every grain floor. Threshing floor and wine press won't feed them. New wine will disappoint her. They won't remain in the land of Adonai. Instead, Ephraim will return to Egypt and they will eat unclean food in Asher. They will not pour out wine offerings to Adonai. They will not be pleasing to him. Their sacrifices will be for them like mourners' food. Everyone eating it will be polluted, for their food will be merely to satisfy their appetite. You will not come into the house of Adonai. What will you do at a designated time on a day which is a festival for Adonai? For suppose they escape the destruction. Egypt will round them up. Memphis will bury them and their precious treasures of silver. Nettles will possess them. Thorns will be in their tents. The days of punishment have come. The days of retribution are here, and Israel knows it. Yet they cry, Ah, the prophet's a fool. The man of the Spirit's gone crazy. Because your iniquity is so great, the hostility against you is great. The watchman of Ephraim is with my God, but a prophet has a fowler's snare set on all of his paths and hostility even in the house of his God. They have deeply corrupted themselves as in the day of Gibeah. He will remember their guilt and he will punish their sins. When I founded Israel, it was like finding grapes in the desert. When I saw your ancestors, it was like seeing a a fig tree's first figs in its first season. But as soon as they came to Baal Peor, they dedicated themselves to something shameful. They became as loathsome as the thing they loved. The glory of Ephraim will fly away like a bird. No birth, no pregnancy, no conception. Even if they raise their children, I'll destroy them till none's left. And woe to them when I leave them too. Ephraim, as I see it, is like Zor planted in a pleasant place, but Ephraim will bring out his children to the slaughterer. Adonai, give them. What will you give? Give them wombs that miscarry, dried up breasts. All their wickedness was already there in Gilgal. That's where I came to hate them. Because of their wickedness, of their deeds, I will expel them from my house. I will love them no more. All their leaders are rebels. Ephraim has been struck down. Their root has been dried up. They will bear no fruit. Even if they do give birth, I will kill their cherished offspring. My God will cast them aside because they wouldn't listen to him. They have become wanderers among the Gentile nations. Well, the first six verses of chapter 9 take us from merrymaking to mourning for Ephraim Israel. Israel has a completely false notion about their security. 
They have no awareness that they have deeply offended Jehovah for decades to the extent that judgment's about to pounce upon them. In fact, I'm going to point out a few verses that without doubt the main merrymaking activity that is being depicted is at a festival time. And it is precisely two festivals, a spring feast and a fall feast that are the occasions. Well, verses 1 through 4 deal directly with the self-assuredness of Israel that their abundance and their festival joy have no end in sight. God assures them that the festivals will end, if for no other reason than they simply will not have the abundance of grain and wine in order to celebrate them. In the first verse, the mention of not exulting like other nations do, other nations by definition, meaning Gentile nations, is meant in the sense of the emotions and happiness that all the nations experience during their own religious festivities. The other nation's exuberance is not to be matched by Israel like it used to be, because they won't have much to be exuberant about. The theme woven into all of Hosea, using various metaphors and illustrations, is of whoring or harlotry. That is, just as Gomer was the sexually unfaithful wife of Hosea, so is Israel the unfaithful wife of Jehovah. And remember, wife is just a metaphor as concerns God, and we should never take this literally. Okay? In our current festival context, the unfaithfulness speaks of the typical activities of, of um, fertility celebrations. Israel dealt with Jehovah as though he were Baal. The pagans, now the Israelites, well, they expected their God to respond to their religious activities by providing fertility for the crops, for the animals, for their women. Israel only added to their sin by setting Baal and Jehovah side by side, respecting them both. Equally as egregious, Israel used many different temples as the locations for their festivities. Sin compounded upon sin, all the while oblivious to it. Now, the first festival described could be Bichrim, first fruits, when the barley harvest was celebrated, or maybe it could have been Shavuot, Pentecost, when the wheat harvest was celebrated. The second festival could only have been the fall feast of Sukkot, Feast of Tabernacles. Now, part of the usual celebration of all these festivals was wine drinking. But drunkenness is not to be tolerated. Drinking wine absolutely was to help relax and give people a good feeling, a nice buzz. But getting drunk, that was going overboard. In Hosea, the concern about drunkenness is mainly about how it leads to illicit sexual activity, men buying the favors of prostitutes, women providing the service. Now the mention of the threshing floor, that's an interesting one. See, threshing floors were more than for winnowing grain. They were large, well-compacted flat places that also served for community gatherings and partying. So it was on the threshing floors were celebrations that could devolve into prostitution and adultery took place. This was described in another book in a scene that had taken place centuries earlier, one you may recognize, in the book of Ruth, chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, I should be seeking security for you so that things will go well with you. 
Now there's Boaz, our relative. You were with his girls. He's going to be winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. So bathe, anoint yourself, put on your good clothes. Go down to the threshing floor. But don't reveal your presence to the man until he's finished eating and drinking. Then when he lies down, take note of where he's lying. Later on, go in, uncover his feet, and lie down. He will tell you what to do. And she responded, I'll do everything you tell me. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything as her mother-in-law had instructed her. And after Boaz was through eating and drinking and he was feeling good, he went to lie down at the end of the pile of grain. Well, she stole in, uncovered his feet, and lay down. And in the middle of the night, the man was startled and turned over, and there was a woman lying at his feet. So, here at the threshing floor is where Ruth met Boaz. After celebrating the harvest, my means of, means of eating his fill and drinking wine until he was sleepy, the field owner, Boaz, dozes off, only to wake up and find an attractive young woman at his feet. He was startled, to say the least, as this was anything but expected. Fast forward a few hundred years now into the territory of, northern, of the northern kingdom, and the situation is no longer so innocent. A man would intentionally drink until he was drunk. He would fall asleep next to the threshing floor and not be at all surprised to awake and find a woman, probably a prostitute, sleeping there next to him. This was the common pagan way of celebrating fertility, and it had transferred into the way that Israel celebrated God's feasts. I mean, no wonder the feasts now get prominent mention to begin Hosea chapter 9, for Israel had even perverted those as well. Well, verse 2 explains that as a consequence of this whoring, that which is prepared on the threshing floor, grain for bread, and that which is prepared in a press, olive oil, will not be produced in sufficient quantity to feed them any longer. And new wine, meaning the product of the most recent batch of grapes, will be too little, and it will be of inferior quality. Uh, quality. See, what's happening here? is further enforcement of the terms of the covenant of Moses. God will deprive Israel of the things that drive their economy and give them daily sustenance. This deprivation is going to be the result of a combination of crop failures and their enemy confiscating what little bit is produced. But the serious nature of consequence for their unfaithfulness takes an even greater step in verse 3. In verse 3, Yahweh says, they have lost their privilege of living in the Promised Land. The Promised Land was never their land. It was always Yehovah's. In fact, the term here is actually Yehovah's land which, by the way, is synonymous with Yehovah's house, just as it is completely logical that not only the synagogue and church, but also our entire planet buckles and staggers towards chaos because of disregarding God's moral law code, so it's only logical that Israel will suffer and be ejected from the Promised Land for the same reason. Deuteronomy 11, 16, and 17. But be careful not to let yourselves be seduced so that you turn aside serving other gods and worshiping them. If you do, the anger of Adonai will blaze up against you. He will shut up the sky so that there will be no rain. The ground will not yield its produce, and you will quickly pass away from the good land Adonai is giving you. There's a sense 
in the first part of chapter 9 that highlights the misbehavior of individuals as opposed to the misbehavior of Israel's monarchy and, and, and priesthood that dominated the first eight chapters of Hosea. So there is a balance presented that says that while religious and political leadership might be leading the charge towards paganism and wickedness against God, individuals also remain culpable for their own misbehavior, for their own sin. The last part of verse 3 speaks of eating unclean food in Assyria, as concerns Israel. Once exiled from the land, there is no such thing for them as the possibility of eating kosher. Food grown, raised, eaten outside of the promised land is by its very nature unclean. Thus the entire time that the people of Ephraim Israel are gone from the land renders them ritually unclean. Ezekiel 4.13, God said, this is how the people of Israel will eat their food unclean in the nations where I'm driving them. Merging into verse 4, it seems that this is expanding on the idea that when Israel is sent to live in other lands, they will not be able to carry out sacrificial worship, no matter how desirous of it they might become. It is because their circumstances, circumstances God has orchestrated, is not going to allow it. The verse begins by speaking of pouring out of the wine offering. The better term than pouring out is libation. Libation. This is a religious technical term that refers to that part of every sacrificial offering that involved adding a libation offering, sometimes translated in our Bibles as a drink offering. Sacrifices always consisted of three parts. The meat, the grain, which is called the mecha, and the wine is in varying quantities. And, and order and exactly what each part could be used for and by whom. It varied, sacrifice by sacrifice. By saying the wine cannot be poured out, that is the libation offering part of a sacrifice can't be made, then it is inherently means sacrifices cannot be properly made. That renders them useless. And since atoning for sins will be the most immediate and critical concern for these Israelites, it means that no atonement is going to be possible for them. The effects of being kicked out of the Promised Land are far more extensive than being forced to live somewhere else under some other government. These Israelites shall remain indefinitely in a state of sin and ritual defilement. I mean, to understand the gravity of this situation, believers. Imagine your prior state before becoming a believer. Assuming you understand what that means, and it means much more than whether you go to heaven or hell, think of it as though God said to you, sorry, but your means of atonement, trust in Jesus, and thus peace with me, is just not currently available for you. God is determined to block you from redemption, and there's no path around it. This is what's about to happen to the entire population of Ephraim Israel, and it would remain that way not for months, not for years, but for centuries. Extrapolate that to understanding that using that same model and pattern since the advent of Yeshua, anyone not trusting in Him prior to their death will remain in their sins and apart from God, not for months, not for years, not even for centuries, but for all eternity. Permanently blocked from redemption and no way around it. Well, expanding upon why those sacrifices are not going to be acceptable to God. 
The next part of verse 4 says that for Israel, those intended sacrificial offerings would be to God as it is with people eating a food of mourning. Anyone who eats a food of mourning becomes defiled. So, God's not about to accept a defiled sacrifice because it would defile Him. This thought of a food of mourning, lachemonim in, in, in Hebrew, likely comes from the Law of Moses. In Deuteronomy again, 26, verses 12 through 14. After you have separated a tenth of the crops yielded in the third year, <clears throat> the year of separating a tenth, and have given it to the Levites, the foreigner, the orphan, and the widow, so that they can have enough food to satisfy them while staying with you, you are to say in the presence of Adonai your God, I have rid my house of the things set aside for God and given them to the Levite, the foreigner, the orphan, and the widow, in keeping with every one of the commandments, the mitzvot, you have given to me. I have not disobeyed any of your commandments or forgotten them. I have not eaten any of this food when mourning. I haven't put any of it aside when unclean, nor have I given any of it for the dead. I have listened to what Adonai my God has said, and I have done everything you ordered me to do. Now, mourners, because they have come in contact with, or have come too close to the presence of the dead, well, they were ritually barred from the temple sanctuary and any of its activities because of the danger of transmitting their uncleanness to the holy precinct. So what can Israel do with the bread, the grain offering, that was usually prepared to go along with their sacrifices? God says Israel will use it to satisfy their own hunger because it's not suitable for any other purpose. Like the meat offering he refuses to accept, so it is for the grain, the bread offering, saying it will not come into the house of Adonai. Here it's referring to the temple, where sacrifices were to take place. Now remember, for more than a century after, exile, uh, after Israel would be exiled, the temple was still standing. It was still functioning in Jerusalem, because Judah was still there and intact. So a kind of parallel meaning is that even though you, Israel, even though you, might change your minds and even your behavior, the temple's closed to you. The severity of what is about to happen to Israel is being further spelled out. A severity that you can just go right over the heads of modern Christians. But it certainly would not have to the Israelite and Judahite hearers and readers of Hosea's prophecy if they had believed it. If they had believed it, they would have been horrified. Such a thought. And verse 5. After explaining the impossible circumstances Israel is going to find themselves in, Yehovah poses a semi rhetorical question When will the Moedim, the appointed times of feasts, roll around? Where do you suppose, Israel, this is going to leave all of you? Then there is a specific mention of the Feast of the Lord, or more li literally, Hag Yehovah, the Feast of Yehovah. There are three biblical feasts of the Hag kind. They are also known as pilgrimage feasts, because all Israelites are expected to make a journey to the temple for each of those three. Unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. In Hosea's era, in his era, the Feast of Jehovah and the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot, were parallel terms. To be clear, the real question that's being asked is what will you do, Israel, when it's time to celebrate Sukkot? Now, while for Christianity, the Passover series of feasts is kind of the granddaddy 
of all the feasts, the appointed times. For Israel, it was Sukkot. It was the final feast of the yearly seven feast cycle, and especially the final day of the seven day feast of tabernacles was the greatest of them all. This is why this feast in particular is mentioned. I think maybe the best word to sum up the theme of verse 6 is futility. The idea of it's this. Being exiled is now a foregone conclusion. Not a thing you can do. There's no way to avoid it. So all thoughts from here on out ought to be, how do you prepare for it? How do you start to mentally process this exile's many ramifications? What is this odd mention of Egypt and Memphis? Well, at this time, Memphis was the capital of Egypt. In today's terms, it's located about 13 miles south of Cairo. Egyptian legend is that this place was first settled by Menes about 3000 BC, and that he is the founder of the first Egyptian dynasty. So, all the following Egyptian dynasties are numbered with Menes as the starting point. Now, Memphis was widely known for its amazing necropolis, City of the Dead. For many Israelites, they still considered Egypt as a viable option, more attractive option, to flee to in case Syria, Assyria indeed did, did invade them. God is saying that many Israelites might choose to take that option. But in the end, the Egyptian place of the dead is going to be where their bones will rest. And that is certainly not a place of honor. Now the next mention of the loss of their precious treasures of silver is referring to what Israel has purchased with money. And in the case of this agrarian society, lands and fields were where most of their money was invested. Good old fashioned real estate. Thus, the next words essentially tell Israel what's going to become of their investments, all their hard labor that made them into fields that produced so wonderfully. A good English rendering is probably this Weeds will inherit them, thorns their homes. So the idea is that should they choose to abandon those fields and rush to Egypt, the land is going to go right back to its primal state. The Hebrew word used for weeds isn't really the generic term for an unwanted pest of a plant like it appears to us. The word is kimosh, and it is a special species of plant that all Israelite farmers were unhappily quite familiar with. In the end, two types of futility are highlighted. The futility of trying to escape from the Assyrian invasion and the destruction it's going to bring with it, and the futility of all the hard work of having saved for and bought fields, laboring in those fields to finally make them productive and profitable, only to wind up leaving them to an enemy that didn't work to get them. Okay, we're going to stop here, and we will pick up at verse 7 next time. Help support God's people by purchasing items made by them. Merchandise with a meaning. Products with a purpose. HolyLandMarketplace.com For more teachings, visit, support, or donate at TorahClass.com Join with us in worship and enjoy God's Word at Seat of Abraham Fellowship.